Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Hey, I'm Joel. I was realizing about four years ago that it's, you know, it's, we're coming up to Easter. And it was about four years ago that I, we were coming up to Easter and I felt like as I was praying, I was really supposed to fast. I was supposed to fast from food. Now, I do not like fasting. Um, it, I, I, I much prefer food to not having food. So, But, and I've, I've fasted before, and honestly, it makes me less spiritual after I fast. You ever had that? You try and fast, and you're just like grumpy and mean, and you're like, dur, dur, and you're just mad all the time. So I didn't want to fast because I'm like, it's going to make me less spiritual. Because when I'm hungry, I would get hangry, and I'd just start yelling. So I, but anyways, I was like, okay, I got to do this thing. But then I started thinking, okay, wait a second. If I set out to do this fast, like, like I had this question. If you set out to do a five-day fast, but you only get through two and a half days of it, does that make you a half-fast Christian? Half fast, half fast Christian. <laughs> Does that make you a half fast Christian, right? And I was like, I don't want to commit to this. Y'all get your minds out of there. You know, get, <laughs> purify your minds. Okay. So I was like, I don't want to commit to, 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 to fasting and not make it through. So I was like, all right, I'm going to do this. So I committed and I got through the fast. And then at the end of it, I feel like the Lord said, I want you to keep doing this consistently. And I was like, oh my gosh, no, I don't want to consistently fast. I was supposed to do it every Wednesday and Friday. So I started doing it. Well, right in the middle of that, I felt like God started actually speaking to me. And I felt like he said that I was supposed to call Pastor Marcus, the senior pastor here, and see if I could come work with him. Like basically like, hey, I need a job. You want to hire me? But I actually had a job already. So I was like, Lord, I don't want to go commit over there. I'm busy speaking around the country. As you, some of you guys know, I'll be gone for a couple of weeks at a time. I go speak at different churches around the country about the books I've written. So I came to him and I was like, hey, huh, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, well, why don't you come on board and help me for six months? I'll take a little bit of a sabbatical and you can preach for six months. And I was like, oh, six months is a long time to commit to. And he's like, just you try six months. And so I, we prayed about it. And I, was like, and I felt like the Lord said, yeah, commit to six months. And I was like, man, six months is a long commitment. But we did it. Well, as soon as the six months was over, I was like, oh, I'm such, I am such a committed person. I just committed six months to be at the same place. Uh, and, and, you know, that's, that's the thing. I've always kind of dreaded being a pastor because pastors are so committed to their churches. And I'm like, I'm not that committed to anything, I, except my wife. But... Uh, <laughs> I don't want to be, so anyways, Marcus goes, hey, Joel, why don't you stick around for another year? And I was like, no, no, a year is a long commitment. <laughs> no, no, I cannot do an, a whole year. And Emily and I prayed and talked about it, and I felt like we were supposed to commit to a year. Four years later, <laughs> we've been here four years, you guys. And some of y'all guys know, yeah, it's a, the crazy thing is, is it's, it's been just kind of putting one foot in front of the other. But man, I was so terrified to commit because I felt like I'd be trapped. Now, here's what I know about everybody in this room, okay? Here's what I know about you. There's something sitting in front of you right now that you know you need to be more committed to. But you have this thought. But if I commit to getting healthier... That'll mean I have to work out and eat better. Man, if, if I commit, you know, if, if I commit to, to going back to school, that don't mean I have to study, right? Man, if I commit to tithe to the church, that'll mean there's like less money and what if I don't have the money I need? And there's all these things that we think, well, if I commit to, well, if, if I commit to giving up alcohol right now, man, Joe's party is next month and Joe throws a great party. That'll mean at the party, I can't, uh. So what happens a lot of times is for us is we, we, we find ourselves kind of straddling these two worlds where we're like, I know that I need to do this over here because it'll actually be good for me. But man, I don't really want to go all in and we kind of have a problem with going all in. And what happens is we usually get miserable in the middle of it because we're never fully present in either of the two worlds that we want to be part of. Anybody relate to that? We're going to talk about that today, about the fact that 
if you want to get the benefits, you have to fully commit. We're in this series right now called The Circle Perspective, and we're talking about the fact that God is always at work in your life. He's always working, but most of the time, you can't see it. So you only get to see it when you can look backwards. Life is lived forward, but it can only be understood looking backwards. So as you're living forward, you're going, God, where are you? What are you doing? He's working, but you don't see it. You only get the benefit of seeing his work in hindsight. Or you can choose to believe right in the middle of it that he's working, even if you don't see him. And you know what that's called? Faith. And that's without faith, it's impossible to please God. So what this, what this whole series is about is recognizing that God's working right now. And there's a very consistent pattern of how he works in our lives. In fact, in Psalm 23, it says, the Lord is my shepherd. He guides me in, this line says paths of righteousness, but in the Hebrew, the word actually is magol, and it means cir- paths made of circles of righteousness. When, a, sh- when a, a shepherd is leading sheep up a hill, they can't go straight up a hill. They just can't handle the intensity of a steep climb. So what he does, he takes them gently in circles up a hill. So shepherds get this language. We don't get it. They're like, what are cir- paths made of circles? He leads us in paths made of circles. And, and, and this is why in our lives, you've probably seen there are certain themes that keep coming back around in your life. Maybe certain time frames. For Emily and me, it's up to this point, it's been three years. Every three years, God changes something major in our lives. For some people, they say it's every seven years. Some people, five years. And these, these time frames, maybe there's certain geographical locations you keep coming back to and you're like, I'm back in Seguin again, right? And you just keep coming and these circles keep coming back around. And God tends to work in our life in circles. But here's the thing. It's not a circle that stays sa- static or the same. As God's love is poured into your heart, he expands out who you are. Can be. And that's why we talked last week about the fact that you have to recognize that we are God's children right now. And what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we'll be like him because we'll see him as he is. So the, the, the main point last week was this. You've got to recognize you must accept where and who you are right now. If you're, if you're in relationship with Christ Jesus, right now your sins are forgiven. You are the righteousness of God in Christ. When God looks at you, he doesn't see the mistakes you've made. All he sees is the perfection of Jesus on you. You don't see that. You see you and you see your mistakes. We know us, right? I know me. I'm full of mistakes and, and errors and blunders and I say dumb things and I get in all sorts of trouble. But when God looks at you, if you have accepted Jesus Christ, all he sees is the perfection of Christ. But here's the thing. You don't stay there. There's even greater things he has for you. So you should never sacrifice what you could be for who you are now. And what do we, we live in a world right now that says, just accept yourself as you are. And you're like, yeah, but I don't like who I am. And the world says, well, you should like you. Just accept yourself as you are. And that's a partial truth. Because apart from Jesus, we got some issues, And you know your issues. You know that thing you keep doing over and over again that keeps sabotaging your success. And people say, well, just accept yourself as you are. That's authenticity. Not quite. You have to start from a place of accepting how God made you, who he made you to be, but never sacrifice what you could be for who you are now. And a lot of times people say, well, people are judging me about, you know, my lifestyle. Well, maybe they're not judging you. Maybe they just see the potential you have in you and that you're not living up to it. And you sit around going, oh, my life, why are they judging me? Well, maybe they just see what you could be. And God sees what you could be because he made you. He likes who he made you to be. He just wants to perfect it. So we walk forward and we recognize this. There is no formula for life. There is only revelation. You read books and you say, man, how come I read the book and did everything they said, but it didn't work for me? Well, because there's no formula. You are unique. You have a unique path to walk. That's why it's so dangerous to compare your life to others. You have a unique path to walk. You have unique giftings, talents. You have a unique background. There's no formula, but you know what there is? There's revelation. Right before Jesus left the earth, he said, guys, there's a lot more truth I want to give to you guys that'll set you free, but you can't handle it right now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to send the Holy Spirit And he will guide you in all truth, little by little. He'll reveal the truth to you. That's why you can read your Bible one season of life, read a passage, and it means one thing to you. And then the later season of life you read again, you're like, whoa, I never saw it from that perspective because the circle is widening in your life and God is showing you more and more of who he is and who you could be. But there's no formula. There's revelation, which is why you have to seek God, not a formula. Religion is seeking a formula. 
Well, what do I need to do to make God happy? Eh, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> Just tell me what boxes I need to check, priest. Preacher, what do I need to check to make God happy? And God's like, no, 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 no. You need to connect with me, man, because I've got a special, unique plan for your life. But the only way you're going to figure it out is if you'll listen and connect with me. So there's no formula. There's only revelation. And that's what sets us on the journey. Every one of us, we start from a place living in fear of not getting our security connection and control met. And I covered all this in the last few messages. So if you haven't heard this, there's a lot of stuff in it. So get the app, download the app, and, and listen to the messages. I think you'll really benefit from it. We start out with the, us living in fear of not getting our security connection and control. And God says, hey, I want to use you for something bigger. I know there's more in you, and you do too. You know there's more in you. And so you hear this call and then you, something happens that kind of forces you into the call. And the inciting incident in every good story, the hero is forced into the action. So you see Frodo Baggins minding his own business in the Shire. Gandalf shows up and says, take this ring and, get, and destroy it. Luke Skywalker's minding his own business and a droid shows up and then says, help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're my only hope. And before you know it, Luke is in an intergalactic war for the universe. The inciting incident happens, but then the character has to have courage to step out into the unknown. We talked about that last week. And fortunately, we do, we're not asked to step into the unknown alone. We have a guide who comes with us, the Holy Spirit. But at some point, we come to what we're going to talk about today, the threshold. And this is the place where every hero in the journey that God takes them on must commit. You have to commit. You have to go all in on the journey. Jesus, when he was on earth, he said a lot of wonderful, sweet, kind, loving things. But there are some things that he said that you're like, whoa, that's intense. There's one particular sequence of stories here, short little anecdotes that, that are told. It says, as they were going along the road, Jesus and his disciples are walking along the road. Someone said to Jesus, hey, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said, really? He said to him, well, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. He's basically saying, are you willing to commit to the point that you're going to have to live the way I live, which means you're always going to be a little bit out of place? And the fact is, if you fully commit to this life of Christ, you're always going to be a little bit out of the place with what all of the people in the world around you are doing. You're going to look different. And it may feel a little bit lonely at times. He says, if you're going to fully commit, that's what it takes. So another guy says to him, uh, to another, he said, hey, follow me. But, but he, the guy said, well, Lord, let me first go bury my father. Legitimate request. My dad just died. Let me go bury him. And then Jesus says this crazy intense thing. He goes, no, leave the dead to bury their own dead. You go and proclaim the kingdom of God. You go, whoa, Jesus, that's very like uncompassionate of you. Like, <laughs> what about family first? And he's like, nope, you got to fully, I want to see if you're fully in here. Are you going to fully commit to this thing? Then Jesus said, uh, then Jesus said, um, Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. He basically says, if you're going to go in and start working for me, you've got to fully commit to this journey. You've got to fully commit to the challenges that are going to come with it. You've got to throw yourself into it. Now, now, here's what I've noticed with a lot of people, okay? They come to Christ. They get all excited about Christ, but they don't want to fully commit to it. So they kind of keep one foot over here in the world and their old way of life. And then they kind of keep one foot in this new way of life. And it just makes them miserable. I, I call it this. They have just enough Jesus to make them miserable. True. Because here's how it goes down. You go partying, living like however you want. Friday, Saturday, you're like, yeah. yeah. And then Sunday, you come and you drag yourself to church. and You're like, oh, I feel so bad about myself. I'm such a horrible person. And it's like, dude, you didn't feel that way before you had Jesus. You felt way better about yourself. Now you've got this conviction. And so there's this, this thing where it's like, you keep going back and forth and you're just miserable. You have just enough Jesus to make yourself miserable. And I see people all the time like that. In fact, Jesus said something to the effect in this, in Revelation, God said to this one church, he said, guys, I'd rather you be like really hot or really cold, but the lukewarm thing, that's disgusting. I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. It's like drinking a lukewarm Dr. Pepper. You ever had a lukewarm Dr. Pepper? It's disgusting. God says, I... Just commit, man. Like, commit to like, live like hell or throw yourself into this thing because the blessings that you want, you got to go all in. But here's the thing. If you'll commit to the path, you must commit to the path. But here's the thing. If you'll commit to the path, the way will open to you. 
You say, yeah, but if I, if I give up all my old friends and go all in with this church thing, I might be alone. Well, you'll never know until you commit to the path. There's so many things in life, guys, that you cannot Google the outcome of. <laughs> you just have to dive in. The Apostle Paul said this, uh, when they were going in Acts, uh, the Apostle Paul was going around with his uh, disciples and it says they were strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. So he's going around visiting a lot of different churches that are going through persecution, going through struggles. And he said, listen, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. What I think is funny is that's right in the line with strengthening the disciples and encouraging them. Hey guys, I've got some really good encouragement for you. It's gonna stink. It's gonna be really hard. But it's what we need. And I, listen, I don't know why God chooses to use pain to strengthen us. I wish he would use marshmallows. <laughs> Feeling weak? Pop a marshmallow. <laughs> Woo! But for whatever reason, God chooses to use pain and suffering and struggle. For your, uh, I read a lot of books. I try to read about 100 books a year. Most of them, like, whatever. I read the book. Okay. But there's some books that changed my life. I read one recently. I brought it. It changed my life so much. It's called Anti-Fragile. This book changed the way I look at the world. And the crazy thing is, it's an economics book. But what I learned from it goes far beyond the rules of economics. This guy, Nassim Taleb, he said, listen, in our world, there's three kinds of systems in the world. There's what are called fragile systems. Fragile is something, you know, if you've ever gone to the post office and they're like, is there anything fragile or perishable in here? Yes, and they slap a fragile thing on it. So you handle with care or when it breaks, you're never getting it back. You know, there's vase, vases or a vase or glass cup. And when it breaks, shatters, it's done. They're fragile things that when they break, they're gone. But he says, there's also things that are robust, robust things that like, they just can handle a bunch of beating around. So you kick this thing, the stage, it's not going anywhere. But he says, robust and fragile aren't opposites. He says, what the opposite of fragile is, and he made up a word, he called it anti-fragile. And anti-fragile things are things that actually gain strength through disorder, struggle, chaos, and hardship. You're anti-fragile. Literally, in a very real way, what does not kill you makes you stronger. And you've seen this if you've ever tried to go get stronger at the gym. You don't do it by lifting as light of weights as you can. You push yourself and you lift these heavy weights and afterwards you're like, ah, that hurts. I'm sore for three days afterwards. You know why? Because your muscles got torn. But when they healed back, they healed back even stronger. If you've had a bone break, you see that when the bone reheals, it heals back even stronger. God made you in such a way that you're actually made to get stronger through difficulties and challenges. Now, here's what's fascinating about it. <clears throat> if you treat an anti-fragile thing like it's fragile, it actually becomes fragile. It actually needs disorder and challenges and struggles. In fact, one of the things he talks about in the book, back to the fasting thing, which I realized what's changed me is when I started fasting consistently, um, I stopped getting sick. And I talked to a doctor about it one time. She's like, well, it makes sense. She said, if your body is spending its whole time processing food that you're constantly shoving down your gullet, she says, it has no time to work on other things that need to be recovered. And there's a, the number one predictor of longevity of life, of how long you're going to live, is based, it, it's this. There's number one predictor across all the studies. It's limiting caloric intake. Isn't that weird? In fact, they, they, one of the, he talks about in his book, he says the Mediterranean diet. Everybody's like, the Mediterranean diet is the path to, to health. And he says, but the thing that people forget is the Mediterranean diet, people in the Mediterranean, because of their religious persuasions, they fast like 100 days a year. So their body has that time to recover. And we're actually made for our body to take shocks to our system. Think about it. We would not be here today if our ancestors didn't have the capacity to endure a lot of hardships. And you're no different. But here's the thing. If we start treating ourselves like we're fragile, we become fragile. And God knows that about you. And sometimes we need to just put ourselves out there and say, yeah, man, this is, this is hard. And, and listen, we're in, a, we're in a country today where everybody got a trophy growing up. And I'm all for self-esteem. I have a master's degree in counseling. But here's the thing. When you're giving people a trophy all the time and they don't learn what it's like to lose and have to get better and have to get stronger, you end up creating fragile people. They're like, my life's so hard. Well, you've never had to face anything hard in your life. 
We are made, and listen, I, this is the temptation for me. Yesterday, my, my daughter got into a fight with our neighbor over a worm, interestingly enough. <laughs> a mother worm. And I'm watching them, and, I, and, and everything within me is like, I want to bail my daughter out of this because she got gypped in this situation. She got treated unfairly. She got the worm stolen. But I had to realize, you know what? My goal in life should not be to keep my kids safe and happy. My goal should be to make my kids strong. Because here's the thing, guys. Listen, this is super important. Life doesn't get easier. We have to get stronger. And you're looking, you're saying, my kids, I'm gonna, how are we going to raise our kids in this world? You're going to raise your kids in the world the same way that your parents raised you in this world, hopefully better, maybe, some of you. But listen, you don't do it by trying to make them safe or protecting them. Now listen, this is a fine line. This is where you have to listen to the Holy Spirit because if you just abandon your kids, it will not go well for them. You have to say, Lord, when do I need to intervene to help my kid in this situation? And when do I need to let them get stronger through the challenges? And yesterday I felt like the Lord said, let her fight it out with that little girl. And they worked it out. Right? But afterwards, I talked her through it. I said, here's why I didn't step in on that. And she's like, okay, dad. Yeah. Listen, if you're trying to make yourself safe, you're going to become fragile. The goal is to become anti-fragile. And here's the thing, you already are. God made you to grow stronger. And that's why Paul could say something like this. He says, we rejoice in our suffering because we know that suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character, which is what your parents always said. It creates character, right? And character produces hope. And hope doesn't put us to shame because God's love is poured into your hearts, expanding out who you are, the potential of who you can be and what you can be. You're getting stronger and stronger and stronger. And listen, you know this because you went through some stuff back there that you go, oh, I don't ever want to do that again. But you're still here and you're smarter and you're stronger for it. And what you're going through right now is no exception. God will often let you go through major challenges because he knows you need the strength to, for the next battle that he's got for you. He's taking you up the mountain. When I'm taking people up mountains, 20,000 foot mountains, we can't do it all in one day. What we have to do is I have to take them up to 12,000 feet. We hike to 12,000 feet and then we camp at 10,000 feet because your body just can't handle the oxygen deprivation. Then we go from 10,000 to 14 and then we hike back down and camp at 12,000. Then we go up to 16 and camp at 14, then 14. And we go at small intervals because your body has to acclimatize to what it is and God's strengthening you in the same way. You're like, why is it taking so long? Why is it so many challenges? Well, listen, the deeper the pit, the greater the glory. Yeah. He's got something planned for you. Now, now, here's the thing. It can get really hard sometimes. But that's what God wants for us. He says, finally, I want you to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Amen. His mighty power. That's his goal for you is to be strong. And the challenges he's allowing you to go through are because he has some glorious plan for you that I don't quite understand. And again, I wish you could get there by popping marshmallows, but you can't. The only way is through facing the struggles. But here's the thing. He gives you the grace to do it. Now, at some point in your journey, it's going to get really hard. And you're going to come to a season where you're crying out to God and he's going to seem totally silent. You're going to feel like your guide left you on the trail all by yourself to figure it out on your own. I have been going through this for the last while, okay? So I'm going to speak really honestly with you about this. It may make you uncomfortable. This is the real battle I've been going through. I have been, St. John of the Cross, he called it this. He called it the dark night of the soul. And every Christian goes through this. It's a time when you call out to God and it's just like you're crying out to an empty heavens, and he doesn't answer you. He doesn't heal you. He doesn't heal the people you've been praying for. I've been really struggling with, he disappoints you. This has been my whole year for me. We had a dear sister from our church, Cindy Reyna. We prayed for her last year when I was in Israel. She, has, she had just been diagnosed with ALS and I just knew God was gonna heal her and do a miracle. In fact, I felt like God told me, your word for this year is miracle. And I'm like, yes, God's gonna heal her. And her husband believed she was gonna be healed. We just did her funeral last Saturday. And I was ticked. I'm like, God, what the heck, man? Like, there's all these goobers out here doing horrible things. Why didn't you take one of them if you needed somebody up there for your choir or whatever? Which is a bad thing to tell someone, by the way. Oh, they just need another angel in heaven. Don't say that to someone who's grieving. But seriously, I was ticked, man. I, you get mad at God, and there's these times where God's just going to be really Silent. In fact, if you read the journals of Mother, uh, Mother Teresa from Calcutta, the lady that helped all the people in India, 
If you read her story, man, God was silent for like 20 or 30 years and she would get mad at him and she'd be like, God, what's going on? Why are you so quiet to me? Why aren't you saying anything? What's fascinating is she actually chose her name after another Teresa from four or 500 years ago from Spain, a lady named Teresa of Avila. And she wrote this book called The Interior Castle. And in it, she's having this argument with God. And she says, God, why do you do it this way? Why do you get so quiet when I'm in so much pain? And why do you not answer my prayers? And this is how God responds to her. He says, don't complain, daughter, for it's ever thus that I treat my friends. And Teresa's like, well, that, that doesn't help. So she says, Lord, it's also on that account that thou hast so few. This is her translation. If this is how you treat your friends, no wonder you have so few of them, God. You ever felt that way? I feel that way quite a lot, on, particularly on Mondays for some reason lately. Mondays have been a hard, hard, for the last year, every Monday's just been hard for me. In fact, Emily will have to, it's gotten to the point where she has to warn me on Sunday night. She's like, Tomorrow's Monday. When you wake up, you're going to want to throw in the towel. You're going to want to give up on God. I always say, I'm going to go start a taco food truck. That's my backup plan. <laughs> and she always has to warn me because I'm like, I'm, I'm frustrated with God lately. Sorry if this offends you. <laughs> but this is the reality because you know what? The longer you walk with God, oftentimes it feels like the more silent he gets. And you're calling out, like, God, deliver me from this. Why, why, what, what? And it's just like nothing. It's silence. The dark night of the soul. And if you're there, let me tell you something. He hasn't abandoned you or forgotten you. And I'm saying this as someone who has to remind myself of this every Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday. I've been walking with God. I've been hanging out in the church for about 43 years. And I've never felt him more silent in my life than in the last year. And as I'm watching around the world going to hell, I'm like, what is happening? Like, where is God's miracle, his miraculous power? And I'm not seeing it the way I wanted to see it. But, but here's the thing. And this is where we, the point we have to get to. When you commit, when you go all in, you'll get to a point where you say, like the song Ivan is playing right now, I've decided to follow Jesus. There's no turning back. And you get to a point where uh, uh, there's this verse where, where Jesus is doing all these, uh, saying all these weird things. He says, you've got to eat, if you want to be part of me, you've got to eat my, eat my flesh and drink my blood. And all the crowds are thinking, is this dude talking about cannibalism? <laughs> and they all start leaving. They're like, this dude is wacko. And he turns to the disciples and he's like, hey guys, um, he basically says, all these guys are leaving him. And Jesus said to the disciples, hey, do you guys want to leave also? And of course, Peter first guy to always speak up. Peter basically says, Lord, I have no clue what you're talking about. And I, I would leave if I can, if I could, but who else will I go to? You have the words of eternal life and we've believed and we've come to know that you're the Holy One of God. That's the way I feel a lot lately in my relationship with God. I'm like, I'm, I want to give up, but I'm in way too deep. I'm too committed to this thing. It'd be stupid to throw away all this after these years. And that's where you have to just go, okay, I'm fully committed. Just like I am to my wife, I'm fully committed to her. The word divorce never shows up in our home. We may yell and throw knives at each other. <laughs> and my daughter's standing in between going, we all love each other, stop. <laughs> it, this true story, not the knives part. <laughs> But here's the thing, I'm in. And so when she's yelling at me, I have no worries. I'm not worried she's going to walk out the door and go away. And you've got to get so committed in your life to your relationship with God that it comes to this point where Jesus is like, hey, you're going to walk away too? And you're like, Jesus, I have no clue what you're doing. You are, sometimes I wonder if you're mean. It's a nice way to put it. And he's like, well, are you going to leave? And you have to get to a point where like, well, where else am I going to go? because the world offers no hope. And I hate all this suffering, but I know that suffering is producing endurance, endurance producing character, and hope and character produces hope. And I know eventually hope's not going to put me to shame. So I'm going to hold on to hope, knowing you haven't forgotten me. You guys receive that? Yep. Yeah. All right. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m., or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. 
May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.